Yes, it will be next year in the next four hours. Happy New Year to you watching UBC TV. And at this point, welcome back from State House in Derby, where His Excellency President Yuri Museven has been addressing uh, the nation. And now welcome to news tonight. My name is Michael Jordan Lukoma, and this is what we have for you in our news tonight. The judiciary wants parliament to pass a judiciary administration bill of 2012 to improve administration of justice. This was contained in a media briefing by the Deputy Chief Justice Owen Dolo ahead of the New Year's celebrations. We have it in detail. The executive and the legislature need to appreciate the role of the judiciary as required by the year to be passed Judicial Administration Bill of 2012. The bill seeks to streamline the manner in which business is run in the judiciary. The judiciary is one of the three arms of government, though it is treated like a mere department. These were the sentiments of the Deputy Chief Justice Alphonse Oinidolo as he addressed the media ahead of the New Year celebrations. We are treated like a department, not as one of the three arms. And because of this, we've struggled, we pursued the question of a law for the administration of the judiciary. Commenting on the performance of the judiciary in the year 2017, Justice Owinidoro decried the existing gaps in the Human Resource Department, a factor he blames for many shortcomings in the sector. Ideally, every, every time they create a district, they should recruit a magistrate to man the administration of justice in that district. It should be part of the policy. It should be something which comes without saying. But we will find one magistrate surrounding four districts with no transport, with no security. My appeal to parliament, my appeal to the executive, is that come 2018, everything else should be put aside and this law is enacted as a boost, not to the judiciary, but to the administration of justice. Owen Dolo, however, speaks of the achievements registered in the judiciary, especially in the areas of innovation. The Deputy Chief Justice advises on the application of traditional modes of dispensing justice known for promoting reconciliation as opposed to others. The end results. Recently, a session of politicians threatened to run to court to challenge the passing of the age limit bill. Despite the limited number of available human resources, Justice Onyidolo says the doors are open to all. Free to come to our courts. Court of Appeal, which is also the constitutional court. We will be equal to the task. We will have no difficulty in dispensing justice in accordance with the law based on the evidence that will be presented before us. That is a task we will be able to do. My fear is, if there are 50 petitions, constitutional petitions, at the moment I'm not able to constitute two panels, I can only constitute one panel for the constitutional matter. How long will it take? He, however, has a special message for those who are ever soiling the judiciary's name. The side that wins, whatever winning means, goes to the judiciary. The side that loses says, what do you expect? The court was compromised. At times you get used to it, at times you get annoyed. But my advice is this. This court does not belong to the judicial officers. We are actually 10 months here. This is your court. I wish people could use constructive means of helping the judicial officers to run the justice. The Judicial Administration Bill of 2012 seeks to establish, among others, structures of administration of the judiciary so as to provide for employment and disciplinary of employees, the funds of the court, and rationalization of its judicial independence.
For us, for me, I'm a traditional person. 2018 does not begin at midnight. If I see the sun rising, then I know I've, I've reached 2018. I pray that all of us, the Lord guides us and we reach 2018 and we make good use of the new year after its conclusion. Dokas Kimono, you've been seeing news. Thank you so much, Dokas. Now, reporters have always been credited for bringing to light issues that affect society. But what many do not know is that it takes just more than the reporter to have a final product on air. In a layman's language, UBC TV's Jen Kasumba describes such people as unsung heroes of television news production. We have it all here with Henry Okurut. Now, is it lack of confidence and trust in the justice system that mob justice is still existent? The answer could be yes or no, depending on the circumstances. This small house here belongs to a woman called Jen Nakiria. The business of sorting plastic material and polythene from garbage here at Chitezi is not that easy. Emmanuel Masinde is one of the many children who have undergone surgery as a result of hydrocephalus. Going by these findings, proponents of the age limit amendment bill only need 14 new supporters to have it passed. You will see stories of all categories, ranging from disaster, including fire outbreaks, floods, human interest, and national events that will keep you glued onto television. News reports that will go a long way in even enabling reporters win awards at both local and international levels. Uganda continues to pay a heavy price for its involvement in the war in Somalia. Russia has a lot of history attached to its name, and one of them is that it sent the first man around the earth, Yuri Gagarina. The constant strikes that have been rocking the ivory tower could soon come to an end. But have you ever asked yourself the role played by people whose pictures you never get to see or even hear their voices? Here at UBC, to have a successful news bulletin, it starts with a planning meeting often overseen by editors who guide on ideas picked up by reporters. It's like a web web, uh, so to say. So you all come together, put up something, and it is uh, ready for consumption by the viewer. And when the editor gives a go-ahead, it is time for the reporter to prove his or her worth. It takes a process, uh, writing script, um, research first of all, writing script, uh, voicing scripts, both in Uganda and English, uh, coming to edit, editing, sometimes that's where you, you, that's where you kill or make a story. But he or she never walks alone. The man or a woman with a third eye, also known as a camera person, is always beside. And it costs mass vanonia. It takes concentration and creativity to get that perfect shot. To me, camera work is really interesting. I like the art in it. It's full of life. As you know, the struggle continues. In a way, a camera person is also in the line of a producer when you're producing a program. So unless you know what the producer wants out of you, unless the producer has informed you what he or she wants, unless you've internalized with that particular production, you can't do, you can't do a better work. However, there are instances when footage taken from the field is not enough, and perhaps the need to refer to old footage is necessary. Here, the role of archiving comes in, effectively played by the library department, as Maria Mundagire explains. If a reporter needs uh, a story that played way back, they just come uh, to the library and then we look for the uh, footage he really wants to use, and then he can use that for the for the feature story, in case he's doing a feature story. And if anyone forgot the unique people, popularly known as graphics editors, then that will be a disservice 
to television news production. Graphics enhances the beauty and look of the screen. Without, the, without graphics, the screen will be flat. For the stories to get to here, you have to first ingest them from the, that, that side, the ingest terminal. So after ingesting, I always come here and tell the news. If somebody tuned from another TV station to another and found a story already playing, it is only graphics that will help that person get to know what the story is about. The bottom line here is that everyone needs the other for a worthwhile product, casting the issue of teamwork into perspective. First of all, you must have a resolve to work together. That's the one thing. And you must have a common goal. And you must have uh, a, a good organizer, a good planner, a good, uh, a, a good leader who puts you together, who makes sure that you move in the tandem and everything works. So uh, teamwork is when people accept to live together, to work together, to do everything together for the purpose. And when the final product is ready for airing, the man whose job is similar to that of a movie director cannot be underestimated. Stand by. Stand by. One such man is Jimmy Aluri, who is a news director. He sits on the commanding chair to oversee the whole process in liaison with studio operators. I need, what, you, what I need to do seriously here is, first of all, I need to go through the running order and arrange the stories. Um, that means I have to be here on time. The director of the show tells you to take, you take something that you know it is at the point. In engineering, you don't just take something that you that all right is not unready. You have to make sure everything is ready. For, for a successful news bulletin, one, timekeeping is key. Then two, uh, communication, because you need to communicate as a news director, I need to communicate to the uh, engineer on desk, I need to communicate the graphics the, um, staff on, on desk, I need to communicate to the editor on desk, I need to communicate to the anchor. It is a mission well executed, something reason enough for UBC TV's manager Jen Kasumba to describe these people as unsung heroes of news production. They are selfless in that they actually carry out the work so that someone else can benefit. Those to benefit are our viewers at home and also those who carry the message to the viewers in terms of our presenters. So many a time you might not see the camera person, you might not see the floor manager, you might not see the graphics person, you might not see the director, and you might not see the producer behind a lot of our productions. That's not because they're not important, but because they're part of the crew that is behind the scenes. Over 60 percent of Mulago Hospital's budget is spent on treating accident-related victims. Now the question is... With the year 2017 gone and 2018 here, it is all a thank you from UBC, with a lot to expect from Uganda's national broadcaster as we inspire Uganda. Henry Okrut, UBC. <laughs>
the development and improvement of existing irrigation schemes to support the agricultural sector, which, is in, which in the past years has been affected because of prolonged dry spells. Nevertheless, he notes that the country is secure for the moment from food insecurity enabled by the sufficient rains received. The president did not fall short of mentioning challenges faced by the country in the ending year stretched from the women murders in Wakiso and Entebbe areas and the eddy of threat in the Democratic Republic of Congo. For the insecurity in and around urban areas, the president reiterates that procurement of modern security apparatus to aid investigations such as cameras is on course. They can, we can make the jewelry here. That is money, that is jobs. Copper. From copper, you, you make transformers for electricity, you make uh, wires for electricity, you make electric, uh, electric appliances. Wolfram, tin, coltan, cobalt, these make very many things, including uh, uh, electronics equipment, all these minerals we have here, you people you have here. <coughs> Given what we have already done and what God gave us, our future is very bright, whatever the enemies of Uganda say. I know this because I have actively participated in these efforts for the last 52 years plus. A messenger, however, Total strangers, completely unknown to us, known as the Harvard Center for International Development, recently put out a study showing that by, that by 2025, Uganda will be the fastest growing economy in the world with India in the second place. That study is quoted here below. His Excellency Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, President of the Republic of Uganda, in the address that we had here live on UBC TV uh, this afternoon. To make a correction, the President addressed, uh, made the address at his country home in Rakitura, North State House, Entebbe. The Uganda North American Special Envoy, Zephania Chiza Seninde, has urged people in the diaspora to continue sending funds towards revamping their community churches. Speaking at All Apostolic Church of Uganda, Watuva, Chiza Seninde said that misuse of donated fund is not a good question. This was during prayers at All Apostolic Church of Uganda, Watuva, Gayaza Archdeaconary Namirembe Diocese, where Uganda North American Special Envoy Zafahina Kiza Seninde handed over a check of 3 million shillings donated by St. Lawrence Schools towards the construction of the new church. This check by St. Lawrence Schools is part of the donations by Kiza Seninde towards the construction of the new Watuva Church of Uganda, which needs over 600 million shillings to be completed by next year. Seninde cautioned the church against misusing funds donated within and outside the country and one that soon will be visiting these churches for purposes of accountability. All Apostolic Church of Uganda, Watuba's Reverend Robert Sempewa, says the church will be completed by close of 2018. Reverend Sempewa appealed to well-wishers, youth, politicians, among others, to contribute towards the construction of God's house. This story was filed by Salongo Kasimante. And from church straight, we'll take a very short break. Do not go away. We still have more news for you. News tonight, we'll come back from the break and this is what we have for you in this segment. With just a few hours to the end of 2017, 
religious leaders continue to advise the public on how best to benefit from each new year that comes. Bishop Patrick Makumbi of Rueza Gospel Healing Center International preaches forgiveness and hard work to enable the economic prosperity. He talked to our reporters John Van Sentamu and Sudat Kaye here. It has not been an easy year, but many, many things have happened. It's a year we have experienced blood, shedding, people murdering each other, rango, land wrangles. A lot of things have taken place. But I'm grateful to God today that finally we have come to the end. Those who have had challenges through the year, we thank God that you're still alive. Those of you who have lost your beloved ones, stand strong, trust in God again and believe that there are better days coming. But I also want to encourage my fellow Ugandans, 20, 2018 coming. Be strong, be of courage, learn from your mistakes. And also, as we finish tonight, as we finish this uh, 2017, I encourage all of you not to misbehave. Control yourself and your temper. Don't kill, don't drive while drinking. You still need your life because the Bible says the dead cannot praise the Lord, only the living. Which means when you die, you are gone for life. You are gone forever. In more news, the Sabine community is more known for practicing female genital mutilation than anything else. However, this community living on the slopes of Mount Elgon is tapping into athletes and making it sound more than the now banned female genital mutilation. And now, as Bernard Diga reports, leaders in the region have decided to exploit the potential in the sport to decampaign the harmful FGM practice that has left many women and girls with lifetime scars that continue to affect their lives. Here's Bernard Diga with a detailed story on this. Sebe region is charmed by a beautiful landscape of undulating hills and valleys, donning beautiful flora and fauna. But behind this beauty is an offensive culture that has demeaned the dignity of a woman. Female genital mutilation is a practice involving partial or total removal of the external female genitalia, often regarded as a rite of passage from childhood to manhood. Though a woman is a symbol of progress, Success and development, whose role lies in maintaining and sustaining life, the custom, norms and traditions have fallen short and suppressed the woman's dignity and social value. Of the two circumcision rituals performed in the Sabine culture, female genital mutilation is most dangerous to the life and health of a woman. FGM national prevalence stands at 1.4% according to the 2011 Uganda Demographic Health Survey. However, the prevalence is almost universal in practicing communities at 95% among the Tepeth and Pokot and 50% among the Sabine and Kadam. The national figures seem to be low, but the practice still rife deep among rural communities within Sabay region. I experienced FGM. It was painful because it was forceful. At the time of delivery, it's very painful, and when you are with the husband, there is no urge for sexual intercourse. These challenges prompted the Church of Uganda to join the advocacy to eliminate female genital mutilation from Sebei sub region through their favorite sport athletics a move that has attracted partnership from Uganda Athletics Federation, Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development, supported by the UN Population Body, United Nations Population Fund. Three marathons have so far been held in the region since 2015, rotating in the Sabini community districts of Kwen, Buko, and the recent one in Kapchora. Athletics is synonymous with Sabay region after several youth won medals in national, regional and international engagements. Great athletes like Stephen Kiprotich, Moses Kipsiro, Simon Ayeko, Joshua Cheptegei are among those who have excelled globally. The advocacy taps into the talent to create more awareness on the dangers of FGM to the woman. Sports in Sebei 
draw the young and old alike on a mission to save the suffering of women and girls. Culture game. So, yeah, I think we are avoiding the, what, the, the circumcision of women. It is something which always spoil girls' whatever future. Yeah. To fight for FGF. Because it is harmful to girls eh, or women. As now we are here because we are against the FGM practice and I really condemn because it is biblical condemn and it is not good for one's health. But we are still fighting it. We must make it, bring it to zero. My message to the girls is I just tell them to work hard, work hard at school. In case you have got a talent, come and participate, be part and person of the winners. To concentrate in running and training. Yeah, and avoid uh, boys and yeah. Run to end FGM is the theme for the marathon, attracting ministers, political, local and religious leaders, development partners, and the Sabini community. We are here to end FGM. We are here to stop inflicting pain on our girls. We are here to stop giving hardship to our girls. We want our girls to enjoy pleasure and joy for the rest of their lives. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we thank you okay, for this speaker. day, a day that we have been waiting for. We thank you for the girl child. We thank you, Lord, because they are mothers of the nation when they grow. We pray that you bless this day as we do this marathon against a female gentle mutilation. Very good. That's a good one. The marathon in categories of 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, and 25 kilometer races starting at different points is regarded as the starting point of the real fight against FGM. We have a race to, uh, to stop women and uh, female genital mutilation. I urge all the capture people to educate their children and also I urge all girls to go to school first and then uh, sports later. Because sports is just a short-term short -term career, but with education later you can pursue your degree and come and help others. Girls should go to school, they should stop uh, circumcision. To expose them and show them, you know, here is not good, this is the right direction. So when FGM comes in this direction, you know, using sports, it's the best thing. Yeah, we, you know, now somebody knows, yeah, here is not good. We also tell them, you know, look, live about the FGM. This is the right way. If you have the talent, use it. Yeah, it's the best way to go. Thank you. A former gender minister and now resident district commissioner capturer Jane Francis Cooker is among the first anti-FGM campaigners. Way back in the 1960s, after getting moved by her circumcised grandmother's sexuality condition, decided to have the backward culture defeated. Cooker says the marathon is a strategy worth embracing. When my husband one time could come and say, Madam Cooker, how long does it take you to be cut? Because he was being intimidated by the community. I could tell him it takes only a second, but I'm not ready to be cut. If you tell me to be cut, I will divorce. So he left me because I could speak on my own. I was empowered. So if we can continue empowering our women, I think we shall go very far. And I think that is one of the mechanisms which we need now to follow and continue with all these activities, running from marathon for running to end FGM, station and so on. The events are often filled with exuberant dances, display of the evolution of dress code and sounds of the traditional Sabine music as a way of promoting positive practices of the Sabine. They point at the rainbow directly. Our new elders, where are we taking our culture? Do you think LGM is the only culture in Sabay? I want Sabine culture without FGM. Since President Museveni assented to the anti-FGM law in 2010 
and with continued vigilance in law enforcement, the practice has gone underground, but with reports of girls crossing to Kenya to get cut. Let me tell you, Kanyangmo, the elders Boy. and the parents <laughs> of Sebeiland <laughs> do just your girls. Educate them. Culture is good. But let us desist from the bad practices of culture. The latest anti FG marathon in Kapchora district was an opportunity for religious leaders to outline key action points to eliminate FGM. To educate the public through our houses of worship, schools, and other convenient places against the beliefs of female genital circumcision. Currently, district officials from Kapchora, Queen, and Bukwo say that no single FGM related case has recently been recorded thanks to the anti FGM marathons. Uh, whenever people get to hear of such an event take place somewhere, the, the, there's always that high turnout. And I want to say that uh, the, the previous one we had here at Amana Ground in Bukwo uh, registered a very, very high turnout. And uh, of course, it's not just like any other event. While there, we give people the information, we tell them the purpose of uh, such an event being conducted. And at the end of the day, really people appreciate that, yes, FGM is bad. FGM is harmful and so uh, we should abandon it. A 2015 baseline study on FGM found out that 91% of the population now does not support FGM, an indication that the practice therefore must stop and open chances for the Sabini girl child to attend school and be in a better health to develop herself. <laughs> Mine like winners. Bernard Iga, UBC TV. Rip Yes. In business, Kampala's 2017 journey has been marred with leadership conflicts between the Ministry for Kampala Affairs, Kampala Capital City Authority Technical Team, and the Lord Mayor, Arias Lukwago. The biggest challenge arises from roles and functions with the elected leadership, accusing the Ministry for taking up their roles and acting without consulting them. Farid and Namfuka and Gloria Gutabinji have this. The year 2017 did not start on a lighter note for vendors of backyard markets. The market that had existed for over 30 years was demolished in February and over 10,000 vendors evicted. This followed an agreement between Kampala Minister Betty Kamiya and the Board of Trustees for Nachibubo War Memorial Stadium plus the leadership of the vendors. Kampala Capital City Authority Council meeting that followed the eviction saw councillors immediately go to the site to see for themselves only to be chased away by stick welding goons. In March 2017, the Minister for Kampala Affairs Betty Kamiya presented a mysterious statement on how this was executed. In the month of May 2017, the Minister of State for Kampala Affairs Bena Namogwanya introduced the Kampala Capital City Authority Amendment Bill 2015 to Parliament on grounds that the existing law does not provide for separation of functions. This was the second time this bill was brought to Parliament. However, the elected leadership of Kampala contested the procedure. There are also issues to do with the amendment of the KCCA Act, which seeks to whittle down the powers and mandate of, of, of the elected leadership. And we have got reports that actually there are machinations going on behind the scene where Madam Beth Kamiya's minister for Kampala is colluding with the particular individuals to first track this bill. The special council meeting held in June of 2017 was disrupted by the division councillors in the gallery immediately after Benana Mugwanya presented the bill to the council. In the month of July, John Sebanachizito, a former DP president, cabinet minister, and also previously a KCCA mayor, passed on. Hundreds paid their respects. In the month of July, the president, through the prime minister, directed that all informal businesses pay taxes annually. And in August 2017, tax operators stopped paying road user fees of 120,000 shillings monthly. Kampala spokesperson Peter Kauju says they used to collect 2 billion shillings monthly from taxes. We are affected almost on a monthly basis uh, since August. Well, we've not been collecting money from uh, taxes, so it's a huge gap. In August, 
A vendor, Basemela Olivia, who was selling handkerchief, drowned in Nachivubo Channel and died while being pursued by KCC enforcement officers. Police and KCC fired live bullets to disperse vendors who had carried the body of Olivia to City Hall. However, this action was contested by the elected leadership of KCCA. Kawuju says this year 120 enforcement officers were suspended and the issue is still under investigation. It was very unfortunate, but um, it is a matter which is still under um, investigation and uh, I wouldn't give any comment about it. However, like I said, it's um, our responsibility as people who work in the city to also observe uh, the rules and regulations which are in place. Uh, there are some that have fallen uh, below the standard, and below the expectation, then there is no room for that. And so across the board, people come and, and people leave. Also in the month of August, the contentious issue of the sale of the land where an Atete market sits erupted and a big number of vendors threatened with eviction. The issue was investigated by committees of council which presented reports on the ownership. Arara also, at the same time, asked for a court order to evict the vendors. This issue also led to vendors engaging in running battles with police in fighting for their market. In November 2017, when the issue of amending Article 102B of the Constitution on presidential age limit came up, some KCCA councillors, especially from the opposition, were arrested as they planned to march to parliament. <laughs> The Minister for Kampala, Betty Kamia, around this time, announced training for KCCA councillors at Chiang Kwanzi National Leadership Institute, an issue that was disowned by a number of councillors. This, however, did not stop division councillors from going for the training. During the same period, tax operators under Utrada vowed to fight any officer who will apprehend their vehicles after President Museveni had passed a directive that KCCA comes up with a figure for an annual fee. It was during this time that tax operators stopped the convoy of President Museveni around Clock Tower to speak to them on this issue. <laughs> Decided to uh, that the taxis uh, originating from Kampala to pay 700,000 per year, and those from uh, uh, town councils outside Kampala uh, they are supposed to pay 500,000 per year, and you pay once. December 2017, the last KCCA council meeting was boycotted by division mayors, deputies and councillors. The council of or authority of 36 members, so all we needed was just 18 members. You can imagine, only 18. 18 councillors would constitute quorum because we are 36. The year was concluded with the Minister for Kampala, Betty Kamia, reading a report to Natete market vendors on the status of their market, which pinned KCCA technical team over selling the land where the market sits. I'm Navka Farida and Gloria Gwitavinji reporting. <laughs>who will enter camp this evening at Africa Bible University in Lugoa and will let them name the, 20, the final 23 players whose names will be sent to CAF before 3rd January. However, Crane's tactician says the selection of the players is based on those who have exhibited defensive and offensive skills during practice on pitch. Uganda is in Group B with Namibia, Cote d'Ivoire and Zambia whose Crane's first encounter in the competition. Isma Watenga, Benjamin Ochan, Nicholas Wadada, Milton Carissa, Nelson Senkatuka, Isaac Muleme, among others, are the players hoping to impress the Frenchman for the selection on the final team that will represent Uganda in the tournament.
Football enthusiasts think seeking what to keep them busy on New Year's Day need to worry much because the Bayern Uganda Arena is to host a football contest where more than eight teams take part. The tournament will be a nine aside and will feature lots of entertainment. How in this report? It seems as if it's now becoming trendy for Ugandans to build a football stadium. The latest stadium is the Bayern Arena in Munyenyo, which is full with all facilities like a swimming pool and tennis court. Uganda Crane's assistant coach Matia Rule says facilities such as this hold the key to Uganda's football future. The moment we get such a complex here in Uganda, it's an advantage, and especially because in Uganda we are in a crisis of uh, playgrounds. It's at this venue where football enthusiasts will hold a New Year Day celebrations through a football competition that will attract more than eight teams. The teams include SONA, which is composed mainly of sports journalists, with the ex-internationals also part of the teams. Uh, this project is, uh, is in, uh, between Bayern Uganda and Bayern Germany, of which we are expect a lot from Bayern Germany. We expect a, 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 a soccer academy here. So a lot, a lot, a lot things concerns with the department. This arena is an arrangement between Bayern Uganda fans in collaboration with Bayern Munich Club in Germany. John Burns, St. Amo, reporting. And that way we come to our very last bulletin, 2017. On behalf of Newsroom, we thank you so much for watching our news and moving with us. That way we pledge and promise to give you news starting with tomorrow to the end of 2018. So just keep watching UBC TV. My name is Michael Jordan Lukoma. On behalf of the whole crew here and UBC TV in general, Happy New Year 2018 and good night.